we're doing the elemental session number four, seller appointments. Um, so if you wanted to join us, you're welcome to follow along in your participant guide. As you all know, I often stray away from the participant guide. I try really hard to stay with it, but what's in the facilitator guide and the presentation and the participant guide, I feel like oftentimes are very different. So I usually try to have on my screen, which nobody can see, I do have the participant guide up. I usually try it, but sometimes I forget to keep scrolling. So anyways, all right. So Ignite session for seller appointments. Um, this is under the assumption that we've gone through the Spark um, uh, training. You've set the appointment, right? The whole goal behind those Spark trainings is to set you up as a successful agent and get you to the point where you can set the appointments. And then as you move through elementals, it's the hands-on fundamentals of doing real estate and meeting with buyers, meeting with sellers. So um, the seller appointments, the goal behind the seller appointment, just so everybody knows what the goal is, to get the listing. is to get the listing agreement signed. That's the entire goal, entire goal. Go with the intent that you're going to walk out of there with a signed listing agreement. Um, we'll go more into this here in a minute, but always make sure you take one with you. Okay. It's a very good practice to get in the habit of doing at the very beginning of your career, when you meet with buyers, have them sign a buyer broker agreement or a buyer representation agreement or some sort of loyalty agreement. When you meet with those buyers, get them to sign something because it makes them more committed. And when you meet with your sellers, have them sign a listing agreement. Even if they're not gonna list for six months, that's okay, we can do a SELM, a seller exclusion from multiple listing service where you don't put it in the multiple listing, you don't market it until they're ready to go on the market, but get their commitment. Trust me, I know from experience, I've even had friends that said they were going to list with me. We went through, did all the pre walkthroughs on their property, helped them fix cabinet doors, find a cabinet maker to replace a drawer front, like go through the whole thing. And then at the very end, they go, oh, well, we decided somebody else offered us less commission. So we're going to list with them instead. Right. It's a very sad, sad feeling when you've been betrayed. No, um, I'm over it. I'm totally over it. I'll go like, because I, I I had her sign exclusive right to buy just because I wanted to kind of just lock yep. in and commit to her. She yep. commit to me. Where does that paperwork get filed? Like on the sky, sky so I'm, I'm, so I'm just you'll hold it um, until you have an accepted offer. When you have a buyer agreement get signed, you'll just hold it and keep it until they have an accepted offer. And then you can upload it into the file with the accepted offer. Um, you can store documents inside of command. So if you've got a buyer broker agreement, instead of it floating around loosely in your office or on your desktop or in the downloads or whatever, you can upload it into command and store it there, which is a great place to store it because then you've got your buyer profile there. Um, you've started the opportunity process in commands because the only thing we really use command for um, outside of our entire CRM and tracking our whole business and automating our business. But when it comes to transactions, it's really just to issue the, the demand um, to get you paid. But you can upload documents into your opportunities or into the actual client file, which is a great place to store it for buyers. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So I just found out say that someone that's military will be moving, but maybe in like summertime, but they haven't told me yet. How do I have that conversation and say, I can list your home. I can sell your home. All right. So for um, that, so Sam's, did everybody hear Sam's question on Zoom? Everybody shaking yes. All right. Just making sure we can all hear. No, I did not. Say that again. No, I did not. All right. Sam's question was, um, she heard through the grapevine, obviously, um, that somebody was, um, is PCSing, they're getting moved, they're getting orders to move. Um, she hasn't talked to them directly how to bring that up. Um, I would just check in. I would just be like, hey, I know it's PCS season. Do you guys get to stay another year? Oh, is that normal? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's absolutely. Okay. This is when all mil so military gets moved like twice a year. Um, and it's yeah. usually around this time. Oh. So usually orders come out kind of at the beginning of the year. Um, and then they they move. So I would just say, hey, I know we're coming up on PCS season. Do you guys think you're going to stay here another? You guys are going to stay at Travis? PCS season? Yeah, that's a military move. They call it PCSing. Oh. I don't know what it actually I never stands had, for. I was in Marine Corps for years. I may not have a PCS. Marine, Corps, Marine Corps may call it something else, but okay. Air Force calls it PCS. Okay. It stands for um, permanent change station. 
Got you. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I just got it. I was curious. They get orders. <laughs> I don't know. That was a curiosity question. No bother. <laughs> I was like, PCSing. I don't know. Hey, everybody calls it PCSing in the area. Okay. Um, so I would just call and be stupid and be like, hey, I'm like, well, I know she'll tell me because she's on our kids' soccer team. Yeah. So I don't know how to be like, do I just say, hey, by the way, you know, I can help you sell your home? Or like, how do you say it? You say something like just that? say it just, just say be it? like okay. yeah hey you guys okay i would just be like hey you guys stay in for another year you guys having to move bases you know um, I can help and you know out. if you end up moving i'm happy to help you sell your home and then go in and try to get them to sign something like that yeah so i would go okay. hey the first step is like i'm gonna come by and do a walkthrough of your property mm -hmm. um let's set a time where we can do that we'll just talk about over the next few months mm -hmm. how to prep your house and get it ready to sell so it sells mm -hmm. for top dollar mm -hmm. um and then when you do that then you would take the listing hey, agreement that's a good you. introduction Hey, you know what? Do you know how to prep it? No, I can help prep your house. Got to get yeah, an answer. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's the first step, right? Like that's okay. the goal of the seller walkthrough or whatever is to look and see what needs to be done to their house to be able to get it on the market and get that listing agreement signed. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Never hesitate to have a conversation. It probably sounds weirder in your head mm -hmm. than it does when you actually have it, right? Yeah. <laughs> And the worst they're going to say is like, no, right? So practice your objective. Friend, yeah. Friend, yeah. So practice your objection handling. So you know how to handle that. All right. Um, so today, obviously, we're talking about how to grow your business by making seller listing presentations and getting those listings. Um, we're going to cover what sellers want before the appointment, the listing presentation, listing appointment, and then we'll let you guys move on with your lives. I'll answer any questions that you might have. Um, so. Um, here's how sellers find their agents, right? So this was the NAR 2019. So it's a little outdated, but it's still pretty close. The largest percentage, which is 39%, was referred to or is a friend, neighbor, or relative. Okay, largest percent is referrals. That's why we're like, do the database too. Call your database, dig into your database, right? We sound like a resounding gong. And, you're like, Amy, stop nagging me. And I'm like, don't go pay for leads. Dig into your database, right? And then not because everybody in your database is going to buy or sell, but they know people that are going to buy or sell. And 39% of people go with people they're referred to. Okay. The other 27% is they go with the agent they used previously. Right? So over 50% of people are either referrals or repeat business. All of my business so far this year, all of my new business is all repeat business. Okay. You know what the other random thing is, is all my closings this year, they're all selling to buy vacant lots. So you want to build. Yeah. Three. I've got three wow. vacant lot buyers. What's the chances of that? I was thinking about that the other night in bed. Weird things that I think about. <laughs> um, personal contact by agent is 5%, right? That would be like door knocking running into somebody at the grocery store and be like, oh, I'm an agent, I can help you. Internet website is 4%. They're 4% of sellers find their agent on internet websites. So if you're thinking about paying for leads, there's your pool. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Reality check. 3% um, of sellers are visited open house and met with agent. And part of, I think part of um, that being low too is, um, well, I, I would say that almost filters in with the personal contact, but I don't think most agents host open houses with the intention to get leads. Mm -hmm. I think they host open houses with the intent to sell that house, which isn't the purpose of an open house as we covered last week. Okay, so it's all in how you approach it. And then other is 22% there. Random, who knows what is fault in there. I missed that class. I, that was a good point. <laughs> I never argued. I never thought about open houses like that. I thought open houses, open houses, open houses open yeah. leads. Get the leads. Okay. Um, what sellers want? 20%, 21% want help marketing their home. Right? So what should we have in our seller presentation or our pre-listing packet? Mark uh, the market value. The marketing value. The marketing plan. For the area, right? Yeah, so outside of that, right, like a CMA or compared market analysis, I don't know who said it. I think maybe it was Martha because um, your box is still green, but you want to have like an example of your marketing plan. What kind of marketing are you going to do to get their property sold? 
a FISBO can stick a sign in the yard, right? And sell their property. But what are you gonna do to help get it in front of more people? 20% um, want help to sell their home in a specific time frame. So as we go through this, we're gonna talk about um, asking more um, digging questions to find out kind of what the motivation is to sell. Why are they needing to sell? Like the example that Sam had, I mean, they're PCSing in June, so they're going to want their property sold. Are they going to want to buy a home wherever they're PCSing to? Do they want to put it on the market and not be inconvenienced by showing? So are they going to want it on the market once they leave? Or are they going to want it to close about the same time that they're pulling out? Like what is their goal and their intention, right? So we want to find out what that specific time frame is and figure out how to meet it within their time frame. Um, they want help pricing the home competitively, right? 19%, that's where that comparative market analysis comes into play. Like what, um, what should we list the home at and what do we anticipate it selling for, right? And then, so we need to go over that with them. They 16% want help fixing up a home to sell for more. And that's where it comes into play. I went and walked through a house the other day and they were like, Amy, what do you think if we, um, I don't remember what the original question was that they asked me if they should do, but it wasn't going to help. It wasn't truly in this market. They're an entry level home. It's a three bedroom, one bathroom home. Um, it's going to, it's in that sub 550 market. Oh. It's just going to sell. Oh. Like there's not a whole lot they can do to make it better, like paint whatever, it's not really gonna do anything. Maybe a dollar for dollar return on it where they could easily make it a two bathroom home. The difference between a one bathroom home and a two bathroom home is like $50,000. Wow. So they could spend 10,000 and make 50. Now this was where it comes back to sell the home in a specific time frame. They don't want to delay two months to put their home on the market. They're ready to go now. They want to move before their kids are out of school for the summer so that they can finish the school year where they're moving so they can meet friends. That's really important to them. So I'm like, they're like, it's not worth it to us. Like we can make more money. Um, they're probably really, truly, it's probably looking at like a 30 to $40,000 difference with the second bathroom in there. But um, it's, they would rather put it on the market and get it sold and get moved. So that's what we're doing, right? So this is where it comes down to motivation and time frame and making sure that you understand where the seller's at and what's their priority. 13% um, want help finding a buyer and 11% have other things that they thought were important to them. Okay, um, under that 30% or under that 11% of other, it was things like, um, help with paperwork or inspections or negotiations. Okay. The process to a listing is we have our pre-listing questionnaire, which you can find in the Ignite Toolkit. Um, it's really important to make sure you have that pre-listing questionnaire. We're going to schedule the listing appointment, send that pre-listing packet or drop off the pre-listing packet, create that listing presentation, and home walkthrough listing appointment. So that's the process that we're gonna go through. Um, the, I was just seeing what was next in the participant guide. Hey, Amy. Yep. In the send pre-listing packet, that's not our, obviously our seller's presentation. So what is that consist of? We will talk about that here in just a moment. Oh. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be just kidding. We'll absolutely cover that. Um, Amy, I have a quick question too. Yeah. Um, how many days do you usually have your for your buyer's broker agreement or your listing agreement? Um, is it 180 days? Do you do six months or do you do a year? For a buyer agreement, I probably do like a year. For a listing agreement, it all depends on when we're anticipating going on the market um, in today's okay. market. Well, and oftentimes with my listings, um, I try to make them either expire like June 30th or December 30th. Oh, okay. So all my listings expire about the same time. Makes it easy oh, that's to keep a great track idea. of. And then I would play like, so anything that we sign now, as long as they're going to go on the market um, in the next like three months, it would be a June 30th deadline versus kind of the second half of the okay. year with that December 30th. Oh, I like that. Amy. Keeps it simple. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. This seems like it would be different. I could that. 
<laughs> listings i don't feel like keeping people on paperwork for a whole year i just right. just surprising <laughs> just surprising That's cool. yeah um your pre-listing goal so your goal before the appointment right we're making phone calls we're doing our legion we're having conversations um we want to state our value right we talked about this back in the spark um trainings we talked about your value proposition what do you bring to the table why would they choose sam You're frozen, Amy. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why did I pick Sam? Can she hear us? I don't Amy, think can so. you hear oh, Amy. Yeah, yeah, I, I just hit you and she got Oh, no. <laughs> Our connection. <laughs> I'm like, maybe her battery went dead. Over oh, Amy. Oh, yeah. there she is. Oh, there she is. There. Nope. I just realized my name is Aiden. Oh, she gone. <laughs> She'll put oh, back on. No. Oh, she dropped her. She probably uh, lost her battery again, like last time. <laughs> oh, because that internet sucks. <laughs> yeah. She's all, and I'm recording. <laughs> oh, man. How are you ladies doing? Any listings? Any buyers? A lot of potential, but nothing in contract or anything. So it's exciting in the sense of just what's work coming up, you know, and stuff like that and just more conversations and things. But yeah, I'm just Good. like, just over, even over the I weekend, know. there was someone just I was like, every mm, night. yeah, <laughs> please, I have, a, fun. I have a buyer, but, um, and I just like every day I'm looking at, um, the coming soon. And so something actually, um, uh, came up this morning oh, there's Amy. and then if you have more than one contact you can oh there them. she is we'll talk soon and back. <laughs> and last thing Yay. we heard was you're you're leading with your example to sam and then that's where it ended we did not hear yeah. anything after that look she's frozen again <laughs> oh no <laughs> poor amy Marcial. so you have oh is she coming yeah. in well, I, she looks so what's the me. price range because it's been hard I have someone um, who I know and that's the thing is like I have like 10 people but their price range is like not work it's not working is it but, under um, five um there is one that's under five but this one actually is they have up to 650 and so okay. the coming soon is a four two they want the Travis school district they want a two-story and it's coming soon um on Thursday Oh, cool. I think it's like Pebble cool. Beach Circle or Pebble Beach Court, something like that. And there's so Amy. $5.99, so hopefully. Amy, can you hear us? Still frozen. Yeah. She moved for like a second. <laughs> she moved for a second. She's yeah. frozen in time. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Are there any callbacks from all of, all of your letters that you sent out? No. So Zero. no callbacks at all. I'm, work, I got I'm, working, on my next, I'm working on my next 500. I am. Um, all right. Am I going to Anastasia? I'm going to. Um, oh, there's no one. Anybody? There you are. There she's coming. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> again. She, she gets I'm in like, hello is that? and that's it. Yeah, she gets in hello. That's strike three. Oh man, we're loss. really we're really not meant to hear the stellar presentation thing. <laughs> At least have it on recording. <laughs> I need to finish my stellar presentation. Oh, sorry, I've been lagging on that. The troops yeah. are Here, fighting. My stellar and my virus. No I totally need to right. edit ours. Edit mine. All right, I can hear you guys again. Can you hear me? Oh, we yeah. can hear you. Yeah, hear you. Yes. All right, I'm Yay. working on the internet connection on my phone now because apparently the office is unstable right now. <laughs> the whole building's coming down with COVID. I don't oh, know. What's going on. Our internet connection now has COVID. No. It's <laughs> in the wire. <laughs> hey, Amy, who do they use for internet? Uh, we use Comcast, I believe. I have no okay, idea. Okay, so they have these little pods that you can plug in to like your office to extend the the wi-fi coverage it's not a, an extension issue it's a service issue 
Oh, okay. Yeah, because I'm not far from where the router actually sits. It's not an extension. It's a it's a office issue. But um, anyway, um, my point with Sam to circle back was that you need to know your value proposition, right? If you're going up against like experienced agent, your value proposition may be like your listing is my entire world. You have a hundred percent of my focus. Where a more experienced agent is spread amongst fifty different listings, and how much personal attention do you think you're going to get? Right. So you can spin it any way you want. It's all about telling your story, knowing your value. Everybody has something to. Marcial, Marcial, I think there's background noise coming from your side. Oh, sorry. You're good. TV. Getting in trouble. <laughs> And then Amy, we're we're recording still, I'd right. I just would hate you to continue it on. Does, it does say it's recording. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe it at this point, but it does say it's recording. Okay, as long as it says it. I decided while we were trying to reconnect, I told the people here in the office, I was like, really what's happening is the world is just against me teaching this lesson at all. <laughs> it wasn't ever meant to happen. That's what I told them too. That's what I told them. <laughs> all right. So pre-listing goals is you're going to state your value. Tell them what you're going to bring to the table. Why should they choose you? We're going to talk about pre-selling. We're going to build confidence and answer questions, right? Um, and then you're going to save time by answering objections up front. Okay, that's your goal. Oh, you know what? And I mean, I don't think my screen shared. Let's try that. There we go. Hey, Amy, you said build seller what and answer questions? Build seller confidence. Build Thank you. seller confidence. In your um, participant guide, if you're following along, um, there's some fill-in plot spots there, and you could like elaborate, right? Tell the seller what you bring. So you would, you may want to spend some time really focusing in on that. On what is my value? What do I bring to the table? Um, how would I build confidence? We're gonna go in and practice those objections, right? You want to go in there and practice those objection handlers for when somebody says, "Oh, well." my friend's an agent or my mom's an agent, right? Um, like, how are we gonna handle that? How are we gonna approach that? Um, so you just wanna make sure you go in there and address that, right? Which, you know, just because your mom's an agent doesn't mean she's the best person. This is the largest asset that they're gonna dispose of, mm -hmm. right? So just because your mom's an agent doesn't mean she's the best one for the job. You wanna go with somebody that has experience um, and as a new agent too, you guys can bank on the fact that you've got experienced agents backing you up, helping you along. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always okay to bring that up as well. Okay. Um, there is the, um, there's scripts in your participant guide, as well as in the elemental script book. Um, it talks about the review, the pre-listing packet. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to get your home sold. Um, you're going to review that with the packet you left with the seller. Did you have a chance to review the guide to selling your home that I sent you? Great. And did you complete the questionnaire on the back? Did you have any questions about anything that was presented? Let's review the packet quickly before we move on. There are some questions um, at the end for you to answer, right? There's a delivering a 10 plus plus experience. Um, I'd like to, for you to have a great experience selling your home. That begins with me being very clear on what expectations are. So I would like to ask you about that. Okay. Right. And they're going to be like, yeah, sure. And then you're going to go through the questions and ask them how to have a 10 plus experience. So that's all part of the questionnaire. Um, you can, there's a part in the script where it's, let me tell you a little bit about my team and company. I work with, you know, KW back of Valley or one of the largest single offices in the County. Right. So you can go into that, like, know the details, know the stats, know what part of the story you want to share. Um, help sellers see the listing through the eyes of the buyer. Right. So we talk about location and condition, and I can help guide you through making sure that um, we set your home up for success, that it flows well, that it looks uncluttered, right? So I can come through and make those suggestions. So that's all part of the script that's in there. And then it sounds like we're in agreement on price. Um, sounds like all your questions have been addressed based on everything we, we discussed. I feel like we have the makings of a win-win relationship. Would you agree, right? We're going to start asking yes questions so that when we go, are you ready to sign the listing agreement? And they go, yeah, I am. Absolutely. Right? 
And this is all in your participant guide. Okay, under the script practice part, and then it's also in the elemental script book. Line up those yeses. Line up those yeses. Get them saying yes. You nod with them, right? Yeah. It's about when we're having conversations, even if you're on the phone, like your body language and your voice mm -hmm. saying yes communicates, like even if they can't really. see you. Okay, I do recommend standing up when you're doing your lead gen and making your phone calls. You will have better energy. All right, in the designs inside of commands, you have a pre-listing packet, um, which is what you would include before you go to the listing appointment, right? Pre-listing packet, we're gonna drop that off ahead of time. You can throw it in the mail or you can drop it off on their doorstep. This is where I say, I recommend dropping it off on their doorstep. I have, uh, hold on. Right, so I like to put my pre-listing packet together. Um, we have a binding machine here in the office with the little spiral bound or little binders. Um, so I like to put it together in a little binding kit because it looks nice with a plastic cover. And then oftentimes I will drop it off with like this little um, pop by that just says, if I can give you a hand, please call. And it has my information on the back of the little taggy. I bought the little taggy off Etsy. Etsy is very handy for coming up with little tags. It's hard to find ones that'll actually like print them for you. And, it, and, it, and this will be someone that you've already made contact with. This is not just some random farming type no. application. This is you know. Yeah, yeah that, that I've had a conversation with them. Or like if you were going to market to Fizbo's or anything like that, then I might drop off like a Fizbo packet with the same Popeye. So um, this is multifunctional Popeyes, but I do like to drop off like a little gift. Could be a little flower. You can search Pinterest for ideas of what you would drop off for a pre-listing packet. Um, but just something fun. You want to stand out from the competition, right? I want to go above and beyond. So not only did I just schedule the appointment with you, but I dropped something off on your doorstep. Something you said just went over my head. You said something for a buyer. What would you do for a buyer? You said if it was the buyer, what? My, if it was the buyer? I didn't say anything about a buyer. Okay. Just then. I thought I heard a buyer. No. Amy, I was yes. going to ask, um, I don't know if this question really fits, but um, just because you mentioned um, FISBOs, do you ever uh, market to expired? How would you go about doing something like this for an expired? Is that, or is that totally different? It's um, it's pretty different um, marketing to expired. You would want to obviously do your research on who's expired. Um, and then oftentimes I would say probably they're getting a lot of phone calls. So again, I'd want to drop something off on their doorstep and you want to make sure that it's owner occupied or find their, their actual physical address by looking for the mailing address in the tax records. And then I would drop off uh, a packet similar to like a FISBO. I'd have an expired packet if that's who I was marketing to. And again, I would drop off a little Popeye because I want to stand out from other people. Um, and I would probably inside of my packet touch on why I would probably ask them, why do you think your property didn't sell? And then I would probably note just a few things I noticed, right? Um, to try to get their attention to be like, hey, I have a solution for you to help get your home sold. That's good. <laughs> So something, so I know somebody that, you know, they had an expired listing or they, they, I think were like under contract, but it was contingent on them finding another property. And uh -huh. so I think, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it, that fell through like the other property they were trying to find. And so, especially now, like, I'm sure like their house would sell because there isn't like, it's in a great neighborhood and it doesn't have like there's not much inventory right but as far as them finding something else that they're going to be able to like find and get an offer accepted like that seems kind of hard to do right now too yeah it <laughs> is and so you may want to come up with some solutions for that and sometimes just a uh, heads up on the mls lately and i don't know why it's been doing this usually what happens is if you have something that's contingent or pending and it expires the listing agreement expires it keeps it as contingent or pending and lately, it's been moving those to expired, um, where the contract exceeds the expiration date if you're under contract, the listing agreement does. So I don't know why the MLS has started doing that. So you may want to do some research if it shows up as expired, like was it in contract and then it went expired or was it 
um, not in contract, just to kind of know what you're walking into. Because um, if it was in contract, it wouldn't expire. Chances are it might still be under contract. But um, but for something like that, when it's expired, you know it was contingent on them finding a replacement property. They were just they gave up because they couldn't find something. It might be that we want to talk about additional options. Like, hey, we may want to put your home on the market and actually sell the house with maybe like a 60 day rent back, which would give you then two months. Once they've removed all the contingencies, then we can make an offer not contingent on the sale of your home and then um, close it. And you've got that kind of buffer zone of 60 days in order to before you become homeless. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a competitive market right now. And so people may need to put a little bit more skin in the game if they're wanting to make that move, which now is a great time because interest rates are starting to go up. Like for somebody to sit and wait for another three, four, six months, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to afford less house and the prices are still going up. Mm -hmm. We, um, I talked with, the opportunity. yeah, we talked with a buyer yesterday who the interest rates changed since mm -hmm. she got pre-qualified about a half percent mm -hmm. on a purchase price of 350,000. It's a hundred dollars of payment. Wow. Just a, what is it now? On the call this morning, they said interest rates are going up again. Yeah, the payment was a hundred with ninety five dollars more with wow. that half percent jump for them. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So you said you take <laughs> off the contingencies before you. What did you say? You said so. If I were going to do that, a little bit off topic, but if I were going to help somebody, it's all right. If I were going to help somebody who was contingent on the sale of their home to do the purchase forward. Mm -hmm. um, I may advise them that we want to go ahead and get the house on the market and the, the house that we, the offer that we accept asks for like a 59 day rent back, right. which we can do with most lenders. Right. Um, and, and then go ahead and get their property, go and get it in contract, not contingent on them finding a replacement property. Mm -hmm. um, and that way we can get all those contingencies removed from their buyers. Because once those contingencies are removed from the buyers, once they've had their inspections, we know the appraisal's good, the loan's good. Like we're just really waiting to close at that point. And we may, you could even do like a longer escrow period too. Mm -hmm. um, because then once all those contingencies are removed, then I would feel confident moving forward, putting in an offer not contingent on the clean. sale of that property. It would be a cleaner offer. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. The funds would still be coming from that closing, but it's you're stronger. set up for success. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yep. So are most lenders like okay with a 60 day rent back? Um, like you just said right now, because anything else would would seem like they're just renting it out to somebody else. Yeah, so see. VA requires nothing more than a 29 day, but conventionally you can go to like a 59 day or a 60 day rent back. Um, I think FHA, you can also do a 60 day. And like I said, you could always do a longer escrow period and once they, so we get all of our contingencies removed in those first 10 days. And then if they find a replacement property, we can shorten up the close of escrow. We can make them so they both match up. Done deal. All right. Um, for your pre-listing packet, um, you want to go in there and get that guide to selling your home inside of designs. You want to go in there and edit it and make it your own and make it pretty and get it ready to go. And then what I would also include with my pre-listing packet is a copy of the listing agreement not filled out. A blank listing agreement, um, maybe a copy of the seller disclosures, that TDS and SPQ that the seller is going to have to fill out so they have an idea of what that's going to look like. Um, you know, anything that, that, that may cause them the disclosure information advisory. Um, so you may want to include things like that in that pre-listing packet. So they have a chance to kind of read through it and look at it before you walk through that door. They're familiar with it. They know what to expect. And then we're just filling in the line items. What are we going to list the price at? What's the commission going to be? Those type of things. Melissa looks perplexed. <laughs> So would you, I'm, I'm sorry, when I walked away, I, I didn't hear part of what you said, but did you, did you happen to mention to like give, give this to them pre-appointment and then once you get there, you said just bring a blank one and then go over the blanks so you're already um, just filling out the blanks and they already know what to expect, is that what you said? Yeah, so in the pre-listing packet, uh -huh. I include a copy of all the, the things I'm going to have them sign. Melissa, did you have a question? 
No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. All right. In addition, in that free listing packet, I would probably include a market analysis as well, right? Um, I want them to know kind of what else is on the market that's similar to those properties and kind of pigeonhole them into where I want it to be listed at so that the expectation is there. Part of that um, pre-listing questionnaire that you're going to ask them before you even set the appointment, I believe there's a question on there of, of um, what they think their house would sell for, right? You're going to know whether it's realistic or not. And then we want to help guide them where they can see the comps in the neighborhood, what's closed, that's similar in their area, similar in size, condition, right? So they have a realistic idea. If we're not sure exactly the condition of the property because we haven't seen it yet, I would include in that pre-listing packet like a, a wider range of comps. Like I might put some that have no updates and some that are 100% updated so they can see the range of where it could be listed at depending on where there's falls. Right, so I want to set it up for success. Um, so Amy, that's where do we I, get this? Oh, sorry. Where oh, do we sorry, get the, this example? The guide to selling your home is going to be in your designs um, library, the KW Designs Library side of command, and then the docs that you would need, you would pull from the car library, um, and the CMA you can do from the MLS. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, once we sent that out, so it's a good idea, right? So we're going to have a conversation with them. We're going to set that appointment. I'm probably the next step after I set the appointment. I may not even go through the questionnaire yet because um, oftentimes you're not going to go through the questionnaire until you set the appointment. Um, but you do want to go through the questionnaire prior to actually meeting with them because you want to know what's their time frame, how serious are they, what's their motivation, what's the success rate of this actually going to sign and close. Um, and so you want to get all that information. So usually what I would do is I would set the appointment, drop off the pre-listing packet. I would call them back and go through the questionnaire and make sure they got that packet and confirm our appointment. Right, that way we have multiple touches going on from the time that we set that appointment to the time that I'm actually gonna show up on their doorstep. Okay, and make sure that they got the packet. So if I mailed it, I'm gonna make sure I give it a couple days to arrive in their mailbox, so they know to go look at it. People like me, like I don't check, I check my mailbox like once every two weeks, maybe, if you're lucky. <laughs> You're not getting a Christmas card. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding. I don't think I even checked the mail since Christmas, to be honest. Oh, no. Um, so, right? So, so you want to make sure they've checked their mail if you're going to drop it off or if they saw it on their front porch. So I'm going to call and confirm that, hey, I just let you know I dropped off a little pre-listing packet for you. It's got some information about your property, copies of the documents that we would go over. Um, and some information about selling your home. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of quick questions? And then we're going to go through that questionnaire and then confirm the appointment time, right? Um, then we're going to actually show up for the appointment. There is a listing presentation template in command under the designs tab, also in the designs library. There is also one of these in the Michael Lewis marketing suite. Last time I checked, they were basically the same. They just look different. So pick the one that you like the look of. Or yours. Or mine. I actually like the new one. I think the new one's good. Um, both the guide to selling your home and the pre-listing template. Whatever you put in that guide to selling your home, I would update your seller's guide in your app on your website um, to match it. Right? So your app, when you open, somebody opens your app like um, the pictures to be the same and the information you can mm -hmm. go in there and edit um so on your phone app mm -hmm. right there's the guides and there's a guide to buying and a guide to selling and my selling guide matches my seller presentation oh, yeah so you can go in there and edit it so if you go into um command that's where you would edit it you go into the agents or the consumer sites and you can edit your buyer guide and your seller guide. So you can make it area specific because the one that's in there is kind of generic. And has I, that I, that. That. I don't think I noticed that on the app, but um, that's basically the same thing as if we were to give them a buyer's guide. 
Yeah, so that's the same. It should match the buyer's guide or the seller's guide. The guide to selling your home that you drop off as the part of the pre-listing. Um, your selling guide in your app should probably match that. You said the newer one. Is that the one that's on the screen right now? Is that through Michael Lewis, the newest one you sent? That you're um, like? Usually the Michael Lewis one and the one on KW Designs are very similar. They just look different. They just have a different look to them. Yeah, I was noticing the buyer uh, action plan was the same as the because I used to run off the Michael Lewis. Yeah. And then I noticed that you had one because I was trying to, you know, a little, little sketchy, whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, well, the, the one she gave me, it, the, the, for some reason, the lettering was oh, it, kind of messed off. up. Yeah, it was kind of messed up. So I was trying to get a clear version. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. So yeah, so they're usually the same. They usually talk with each other. Michael Lewis knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. I met Michael Lewis. Um, Michael Lewis knows what's going on with KW Designs and they usually try to make their presentations and guides all match up. Um, they just have a different look and feel to them. So you just wanna go with what appeals to you and your business and then go for consistency. Yeah. Amy, were you saying that the pre-listing guide is in command, right? near where the listing is the listing presentation uh yeah so it's going to be a guide to okay. selling your home versus the listing uh, presentation it should be in the design library you'll search under i think it's under guides or something so i wonder can you link that to like i guess your facebook or your and say hey are you like like a lead magnet kind of a thing. You could um, you could share your app guide. So from the app, I think you can share the guide and you can share it to your social media and stuff. Absolutely. Right. I think title companies got something like that too. <laughs> and it's just like it's like, hey, you know, when you go into the 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 title companies uh uh, fidelity what yep. it is and they have uh oh, yeah, they have they have a whole toolkit yeah, yeah. yeah a whole toolkit and some of that stuff you can actually if you have a particular client make it fit their needs particularly and then either send it to them or yep. put it on facebook just say hey this is what you can do if you follow this category yep the title company your lenders they all have lots of tools that you can utilize to help promote buying selling and use it for right why recreate the wheel why spend hours recreating posts and information if you can get it at your fingertips from one of the resources that you already have okay um as you go through the seller presentation um there's lots of cool pages in here i do like the new seller presentation it just talks about like um you know what's one thing where your needs come first. So we're trying to figure out like, hey, what is your dream? What's your motivation behind the moving? And then how can we make it happen? So one of the really good questions is why is that important to you? I want to move before summer. Why is that important to you? Right? We're trying to not ask yes or no questions. We're trying to ask open-ended. And that one, remembering that why is that important to you question will come into play with both your buyers and sellers. Why is that important to you? Right? We want to get down to the 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 meat and potatoes of what is important and why so that we can with a seller we want to keep them focused on that goal right we want to help them move away from pain and to pleasure so we may need to remind them of that every once in a while when we show up two days before photos and nothing's been done you can be like I know the net was really important to you like getting making sure that we you walk away with a hundred thousand so and that was important to you so that you can make your purchase or pay cash for the house when you move to Texas or whatever it is. Um, in order to make that happen, I really need you to do these five things before we do pictures in two days. Right? Yeah. We want to keep that, we want to keep that forefront. So we want to know why is that important so we can continue to keep them focused on the goal. Okay. This um, these most of these pages in here. Um, where it talks about like what's one thing that has to happen in order to make your dream scenario reality and then mm -hmm. you go how can I make that happen for you why is that important for you if we could add just one more thing to make the process even better what would that be why is that important and if we could add just one more thing right we probably want three to five things in there that would help them to have a 10 plus plus experience right mm -hmm. so we want to find out what their expectations and what their needs are um you will practice 
So your listing presentation with your script partner, we haven't said that word in a while. Get a script partner one. if you don't have one. <laughs> Track somebody down. At one point, I was just going to assign everybody script partner. So if I need to do that, holler at me and I'll just start assigning new people. <laughs> and then you can randomly call each other and practice your scripts. But practice, sit down like you're doing. <laughs> That's why we do it. That's one of the biggest things that guy was talking about on that meeting uh, the other day. That one new agent out on the East Coast was like, I do my scripts. I make sure I do. I do. Scripts in the morning, so I'm like, God. And if you're like, scripts make me nervous, that's why you script practice. The more familiar you become with them, the less nervous you are. You just know the information, you know the objections, you know what you're yeah. going to say. In fact, you don't even think at that point that you're doing scripts. Somebody will walk into somebody in the grocery store and somebody will say something and all of a sudden it'll just start rattling off your, your tongue. You'll be like, oh my gosh, and all that practice thing. was like magic and it all actually worked and fell into place. And I wasn't nervous at all. And I knew what I was going to say. And I knew that if they said, that their best friend was an agent. I knew how I was going to handle that or whatever, right? So we want to practice, 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 practice. I would say for new agents and seasoned agents, it really doesn't matter, but um, your script practicing is as important as your lead gen, right? It will make your lead gen time more successful if you know your scripts. Amy, I was going to ask you, um, I know like in a lot of the trainings and things like that there are scripts within but is there like a general spot like where all these scripts are being kept or is there not something like that yet yeah so um most of these that we've been covering in this are all in the ignite toolkit there's a spark script book and there's a elemental script book okay so those are just it those ones yeah okay like on the pcp whole folder yeah just go in there okay. go to the ignite tool go okay. open pc peeps folder ignite toolkit ignite toolkit again because it's only fixed it and then um it'll open up all the tools in there and there's both those script books are in there okay. so everything that we've been going through like in here because i know there's been things throughout like they're all in that spot like i wouldn't have to worry about oh this one's here you know what i mean i'm gonna say yes they are I'll double check it <laughs> and you never know. <laughs> I'll cross reference. Thank you. Um, right. It talks about handling seller objections, um, practicing that. Just so you know, there is a close the deal script practice on page 13 of your participant guide. And really what it comes down to when you get into objections, number one, you want to know what to say. So you got to practice those seller objections. And then number two, if they're like, well, I just don't know that I can get the right price for the home. So then your response is going to be, okay, well, if we can get you the price that you want for your home, is there anything else that would prevent you from selling your home? Right? We're going to go back just like when we, Closing. when we talked about, um, you know, a delivering a 10 plus plus, like, what is important? What is your dream scenario? What can I do to make that happen? And then um, why is that important to you? That question. When we start talking about objections, we want to isolate those objections. So we want to be like outside of price. Is there anything else that would prevent you from listing your home? Well, I'm also, you know, I don't want to be inconvenienced too much by showings. Okay. Well, outside of making sure we sell your home for the right price, and that we don't inconvenience you too much for showings, is there anything else that would prevent you from selling your home? Right, we wanna isolate those objections and then we address the objections. So isolate and then address, okay. Um, the listing appointment, that's the end of your participant guide. Um, I'm sorry. Um, as part of your walk, as part of your seller presentation, right? So we're going to set the appointment. We're going to drop off that pre-listing packet. We're going to go through our questionnaire. If we go through the questionnaire and we determine that they're not really ready to sell like in the next six months, um, we may go ahead and cancel that appointment or we may just shorten it. We may go into that appointment with a different objective, right? So um, if they're not ready to sell, their motivation's not there, the timing's not there, they're really thinking a year out, then our goal isn't so much like, let's get it signed, let's get the date set for the photos, let's get the sign in the yard, let's yeah. move forward. It may be more like, hey, we just want to build relationships. So instead of like an hour long appointment, I'm really going to aim for like 30 minutes in and out to just do, hey, perfect. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of your home. We're going to pinpoint some things that you can do over the next year to get your home sale ready, right? And have them sign that. You could still have them sign a listing agreement if you wanted to. If they're like really closer to year out, I'm probably not going to have them sign it. Maybe that's a bad practice on my part. I just don't want them hanging around out there that long. Um, but I still want to meet with them, build relationship, and then start that ball rolling and get their head thinking, find out what their goals are when they sell. So if they're thinking, well, well I'm going to sell and then I'm going to buy another home, then I may be like, hey, it's been a while. You've been in this home for like 10 years. We may want to go ahead and start talking with a lender as well. I know you're thinking like a year out but just making sure that you're in a position to do the purchase forward that you're wanting to do. And if not, we've got some time to get you there. So it's never too early to start having that conversation with the lender, right? So it, the objective might change a little bit if they're thinking really it's like a year. I feel like you can kind of stick them with a lender. You have a better chance. Yeah, because that lender is going to help boost you up as yeah. well. And then mm -hmm. you guys are both going to be touching them, assuming that you work with a lender that has a great follow-up plan as well, that has the same initiative and work ethic that we do as agents in Keller Williams, that now you guys are both going to be touching them and tag teaming mm -hmm. and keeping each other updated of kind of where they're at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if they're ready to sell, they're thinking, you know, in a week, two weeks, six months, then my goal is I'm going to go do a walkthrough, um, to get an idea of what the condition of their house is. As I do that walkthrough, I'm going to make some notes. One of the things that we talked about, um, previously was when you walk into their home, um, you're gonna ask them, hey, did you have a chance to go through that pre-listing packet? Or I've got some questions, did you answer the questions? They're like, no, I didn't. You're like, perfect, here's those questions again. If you don't mind, I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough of your house. And if you could take care of answering these questions for me, then we'll be ready to sit down and have a conversation, review this information once I'm done with the walkthrough. They're like, oh, but I wanted to do the walkthrough and show you everything. Be like, um, actually, so when buyers walk through your property, you're not gonna be here to show them everything. So I'm going to walk through it with the eyes of the buyer. What's the buyer going to see? I'm going to make some notes for you and some suggestions. And so just going to do a quick walkthrough. As I'm doing that walkthrough, I'm going to make notes, like pull the bed away from the wall, declutter the bathroom, clean out the closet. It's oozing, right? Like whatever it is, I'm going to start making all of those notes. So I have stuff to give them. Pull the bed away from the wall. <laughs> so a lot dust. of people, no, dust. Yeah, a lot of people, take their beds, especially in the guest room, not so much the master, but their guest rooms, and they shove the beds against two walls, oh. um, which makes the room seem small because now you're like, oh, there wasn't enough room for the bed to be away from the wall where you can access both sides of it. So if it's not a twin bed, it should not, it should be a nightstand distance away from the other wall. Oh. And so I usually make that suggestion to pull it away. It just gives the illusion that the room has more space. Got that. So little things like that, right? When you walk through their living room, are you tripping over furniture? Do they need to rearrange the couches, um, make a difference so that you can, you know, walk in the door and walk into the kitchen? Or when you're in the kitchen, are you tripping over door chairs and tables to try to get to the backyard? And do you right? just tell them like, okay, move this, 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 and this, like without hurting their feelings? Like, cause you know, people are gonna like their space. Cause I have a person who want, you know, was thinking about selling their house and like, it is just, full of crap like a lot and it's like how is she going to clean all this out by herself because and, and she has pets and it smells and it's just like oh my god inside and out uh, <laughs> you may not be able to fix it all but um, <laughs> our goal is to not hurt their feelings and to be honest right like we want to be honest in some cases you may want to start building relationships with professional stagers, even if they're not going to bring in their own furniture, even if you have somebody else come in to make the suggestions, if you feel like it's a really touchy subject and the relationship's kind of touching, you might hurt their feelings. You can always pay somebody to come in and make those suggestions for you. Or, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, how we live in our home is a lot different than how we set up our home to sell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some suggestions to you on what's going to help your home look its best when we have buyers walking through it. So we may need to move some stuff out of the house. We may need to move some stuff around, but just know that I have your best interests at heart, trying to get you the most amount of money for your house. So it'll sell in the quickest amount of time and you'll net the most at the end of the day. Does that sound good? And they'd be like, okay, yeah, that sounds great. Perfect. So what we need to do is, I know you really love that recliner. 
but it really clogs up your living room and it doesn't make your, it's a little oversized for the room. So is it a potential that we could get that out of the house before we go to show the property? Oh yeah, we can probably do that. I hate it anyways. My husband loves it, but I've been looking for an excuse to get rid of it, right? Like, or hey, you know, there's a heavy pet smell in here, which is probably coming from those pet beds. So when we go to show the property, we're gonna wanna remove the pet beds to the garage or the litter boxes or the whatever it is to help eliminate that smell. We may wanna, right before we go on the market, we may wanna try cleaning the carpets, right? Just to help it smell fresh. Or we do our job. And bring Even, lots of air fresheners. And, uh, air fresheners will not make pet smell go away. Or opening the windows. <laughs> or opening the windows. Mm -hmm. Sometimes carpet, if they've been peeing on the floor, carpet cleaning well, is not going to help either. Walls, no. If you wash the walls, the yeah. walls bleed and windows bleed, but they're not going to hold. Yeah, yeah, so bad. So, but so we want to be tactful and we just want to remind the seller that, hey, I'm going to make some suggestions to help your home look its best when we go to show it. Is that going to be okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Ask for permission. Right. Um, and never be like, oh my gosh, your closets are so full of crap. Like, can you get some of that out? You're just going to be like, so we're getting ready to move. So anything you're not going to use in the next three months that's in those closets, let's go ahead and pack it up because the more empty your closet looks, the more spacious, spacious it appears. And we want buyers when they walk through the pro your property to go like, oh my gosh, this house has so much storage, even though you and I know it doesn't. Mm -hmm right? So we're going to pack that stuff up. So that's how I phrase it to my sellers, like things that we're not going to use, clothes that you're not going to use, those guest towels that you haven't used in five years, like let's go ahead and pack those up because we're not going to use them in the next three months. Mm -hmm. right? Amy, how do you, uh, sorry, for in the sense of storage, are you just telling people put that in your garage? Are you saying go rent a pod? Or are you saying go get a storage unit? Like, yes. What does that look like? So most of my sellers, I recommend that if they need a place to store stuff that they're getting, they're packing up, getting ready to move, that they put that in their garage. I always let them know that we're not going to take pictures of the garage. Buyers anticipate that you're moving. And so your garage full of boxes isn't going to scare a buyer off. But we don't want to stack those boxes up against the walls because when it comes time to do inspections, the inspector is going to need to see that line of the wall to make sure there's no subterranean termite activity or any damage. So leave it at least 12 inches from the wall, try to stack them neat. And we want the buyers to be able to walk out into the garage from the house or the access door and look around and see it, mm -hmm. right? So don't make a wall in front of the door, stack it on the other side. So put it down the center. <laughs> yeah, down the center is good. The other side's good. Either way works. Got it. Okay. So we just want our buyers to be able to walk into that garage, see if there's an access point to the backyard see the garage doors if there's like utilities right your heater or water heater in the garage to be able to see that and then go back inside so if you only have one bathroom and no garage how much more does that decrease the property value oh my gosh because i heard you say when you only have one bathroom that already brings it down like 50 grand so i'm like this yeah i mean has one bathroom and no garage <laughs> So, location. so it's all about the pricing it appropriately. So um, not knowing the location or the condition of the house, I would say you've got one bathroom, no garage. You're probably going to list somewhere in the 450 range in Vacaville. Yeah, this is like right on the corner of your Azalea house on Orchard. Yeah. yeah. It's like right on the corner. So this house was like transplanted from somewhere else, like into that corner lot. The good news so is that, that three, makes it walking like distance one. downtown. Yeah. I remember your um what you wrote on your Azalea property. Yeah. yeah, so right. So it's got one bathroom, no garage. It's not a big, it's just about pricing it appropriately. And again, not looking at the property, not knowing anything about it. I would say you're probably gonna end up pricing it up in that 450 range. You're probably still gonna get multiple offers. If you price it at 500, you're probably not gonna get any offers. But if you list it at 450, you're probably gonna end up in the 470, 475 range. Cause people are crazy. I think it was yesterday. I feel like I'm, Heather correct me cause you were there. But I think it was Mindy said something like what well, house in Vallejo went like, was it 130,000 over? Was that what it was? Yeah. I was like, yeah. 
Yeah. What are people doing? But people want houses, so. They want houses. Yeah. So yeah, so it just comes down to- it was a dump. Really. And if somebody doesn't have any garage space and we're talking about like packing stuff up and trying to get it ready to move, in that case where we've got no garage, it's gonna be a small house anyways, because it's a it's a one bathroom house. We may then recommend, you know, I may, I may recommend that, hey, you get a small storage facility so that as you pack stuff up to declutter to prepare your house to sell and make it look more spacious and roomy, that we take those boxes and put them into a short-term storage situation. Would that be something I feel like a long time ago you had made mention about like a fund that kind of helps with those types of costs or I don't think it was that I think it was more of like unexpected things coming up what was that it was like two thousand dollars I feel like oh so time. like when I do my seller net sheets yeah I usually cool. include a miscellaneous um, fee of like 500 bucks to catch some of those recording title notary fees and then I usually will um guess at what may be needed for repairs got it a home that's in really good condition i would probably never do less than like 2000 or 2500 and one that needs more repairs is probably going to be like i'm going to put a number in there of like 5000 to you know if it really needs a lot of work um we're probably selling it as is but you're probably got that middle ground of somewhere between like 5 and 7 um and mainly because in this area we've got so many military buyers that require a clear pest inspection I just want to anticipate that, that if we get only VA offers or only VA and FHA offers, what are we going to need to do to get this house sold? So I'm going to try to make a, I, I, I buffer the net sheet with that up front. So when I present that to my sellers, if they ask for one, number one, I don't normally present a net sheet unless a seller asks for it. And number two, if they do ask for it, I'm going to add some buffer fees in there so that when the buyer comes in and we're in contract and they put in a repair request for 2,500 bucks, I can be like, well, um, the good news is the buyers asked for some repairs and that net sheet that I gave you where it showed you netting 140,000, I already took $2,500 into account for that. And they're only asking for 2000. So you're actually going to end up netting a little bit more than what we talked about. And I've already accounted for those repairs and they're gonna be like, oh, perfect. Let's just agree to it then and move on. Okay. Got it. That's <laughs> right. One, one step ahead. Always one step ahead. I was, yeah. Amy, I have a question. Have you ever utilized the ready to sell program with any of your clients? Um, we started going through the ready to sell program with a client that I had out in the KP Valley. Um, and then we ended up not proceeding forward with it, um, mainly because of the fact that they decided it really didn't make sense for them to sell. And we talked about, right, what their dream scenario is. It was going to be impossible for them to find that. And I they finally, one day, they're like, Amy, I just, I'm not sure we, I'm like, I don't think you can. I think you're better off figuring out how to stay, mm -hmm. right? I'm not afraid to tell a seller not to, not to sell. Um, so that was the only time we went pretty far into that program though. Mm -hmm. Like we had the contractor and quotes and stuff going on um, as part of that program before we bailed on it. It's a good program. If you've got somebody that, again, you've got to make sure that the improvements are going to make sense. And in a buyer's market, it definitely would. In a seller's market, you got to make sure you're not just wasting time and energy that we're just not going to, it's not going to be a dollar for dollar because what's the point that we're actually going to make a gain on it due to the improvements. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so your, your actual appointment, we're going to do the quick walkthrough. We're going to make some notes. They're going to fill out the questionnaires. Then you're going to sit down with them and go through that seller presentation with them. You're just going to walk through. You're going to find out more about their motivation. We probably already had a conversation because we did the seller questionnaire. So we kind of know what their goals are, but we're going to dig further into those goals, further into the exact time frame. We're going to talk about like, okay, well, we're talking about you want to be in your new house by July your escrow is going to be about 30 days. Your property is going to be on the market for at least a week. So we probably need to start preparing to go on the market come mid-May at the latest, maybe even early May. Do you think you'd be ready for photos come the second week of May? Right? So we're going to start having those conversations and talking about, we normally go on the market on either a Wednesday or a Thursday. That would put you, if we did photos on this day, that would put us on the market on this next, you know, the next week or two weeks later on this date. 
Um, that would set us up that we're going to be on the market from Wednesday until that next Tuesday for showings. Any offers that we receive, we're going to review on Wednesday and select an offer, or we're going to carry forward into that next week of being on the market. Um, and that would set you up to close right about at the end of June. Does that sound good to you, right? So we're going to start talking about like timeframes and dates so that we can get them committed. We're going to talk about price, even if they're like, hey, it's, I don't know, to the day is January 25th. I knew that because it's my mom's birthday. My yeah, birthday is tomorrow. Birthday. That's good. <laughs> That's not so important. Time frames. Hey, you want to prepare before? I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking about, I don't know why I'm thinking about her person. I'm just thinking of things of getting them. Yeah, getting them, get right? Them. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to talk, you know, it's January. They may not be ready to sell till May. But that's okay. We're going to still sit down and talk about what dates look like and what time frames look like. And when we start having that conversation about price, it's going to be like, if we were going to list your house today, here's, here's what we, here's the comps and here's what we'd be looking at. And does that sound like, like a winning number to you, right? We're going to talk about what that looks like and guide them. We're going to let them know that, Hey, since we're not going to come on the market until May, even though we're putting this number on the listing agreement, we're going to come back and reevaluate it about two weeks before we really get ready to go on the market, depending on what the market's doing and how things are moving along and, and how the market's changed between now and then. Does that sound good? And be like, yeah, thank you. That makes sense. And then you also can let them know that, hey, since we're talking about, you know, it's probably going to be three or four months before we go on the market. If I start to see the market change in any way in a negative I'm going to make sure that I reach back out to you. We may want to bump that time frame up if we start to see the market slowing down. Right? Yes. Yeah. So we want to have that conversation with them because if interest rates start to go up, it's going to slow the market down a little bit. I don't know that it's going to stall the market or cause the market to go down at this point because we still have so little inventory as far as so many buyers. Yeah. So. I don't know that it's going to like tank the market, but it'll definitely slow the market. So we just want to prepare them in advance for that. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately you're going to sit down after you go through that listing presentation, you're like, perfect. Um, let's get the ball rolling. I'll get pictures scheduled for that date that we talked about. Here's the listing agreement. Let's go ahead and sign that and get that taken care of. And then we're going to move on with life. I'm not going to ask, do you want to sign the listing agreement? We're just gonna assume they're going to. We are sending you the same grant here. Yeah. <laughs> so so if you said they're not ready like until like six months to a year, um, you would still just have them after talking to them about the walkthrough that you did, like, okay, just sign here and then we'll be in touch with the remaining steps as we get closer to you wanting to sell. Yeah, so, um, so if we're talking more than six months, um, that kind of eight, nine, 12 month time frame, then we're going to put some fictitious dates in effect. I'm going to have them, you know, I, I would say when possible, like go ahead and have them sign that listing agreement and you can just put a date on there and just be like, Hey, this date's flexible. So if we decide you want to move forward faster, we can change this. Or if you decide you're not quite ready yet, or things haven't fallen into place with your new business that you're opening or whatever it is, we can delay that further, right? So we're always going to let them know that we can fluctuate those dates and timeframes, but that this allows you to begin um, preparing and marketing and, and everything for their property. I have a question. Is that, how is that, is that different from, do you have exclusive rights to that commission at that point, or does that have to be a different contract to get That's, exclusive? No, the listing agreement is exclusive. the exclusive right to sell. Okay. And it could be too that you're just letting them know that, hey, um, you know, I know it's far in advance, but I'd still like to go ahead and get this taken care of because this solidifies our agency relationship. It allows me to give you the list and then it'll allow me that if I see anything changing in the market, I can let you know um, to keep you posted on what's going on in the market. Or even you could be like, oh, I make sure I only have one listing hitting the market each weekend. I don't want multiple houses and that way we can make sure that we have open houses scheduled and that you get all the attention on that opening weekend mm -hmm. and so i just want to make sure that we kind of solidify that weekend today mm -hmm. right Mark. so there's lots of ways we can get that listing agreement signed mm -hmm. 
any recap? So what if they say, so what if they say like, after you like, you know, they're pushed back on, I know you always want to dig deep and be like, why do you not want to, like to sign this or whatever the case may be, but let's just say they're just like, I just don't feel comfortable signing it. Like, what would your, I guess, what would your response be? So your goal is by the time you get to that point where you're like, perfect, let's take care of the listing agreement, you've kind of already um, clarified those items. And if they're like, well, I just don't feel comfortable signing it, you could just ask them, what about it makes you uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Right. Because like, especially if they don't want to like sell like, you know, in, until like six months or so, then they're like, okay, like if they just feel like I don't need, I don't feel the need to sign something. If I feel like, or like, who knows, like maybe they're going to just change their mind about selling the house. Yeah. And you can always be like, well, you know, we're, we're talking, if they're like, well, the reason I feel uncomfortable is because like, we're thinking that this is the direction we may go, but we may decide that we don't want to sell. And you can be like, that's not a problem. We can cancel it at any time. You have no obligation, but, but this if, just allows me to make sure that I save that on market day in that time frame for you so that I can focus in on your listing and get you ready to go and then also make sure that I just keep you updated of what exactly is going on in the market in case we start to see any changes or shifts happen. What about saying more of like I'm gonna I know like I'm I'm working on it like I'm spending time working on it even though it's not going to list for six months like I'm still going to keep you updated on the market and updates maybe yeah letting them know that you're putting your time into yeah, it. Yep absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And Amy, just to clarify, so the the time that you, they're signing on that is like you were saying, it's for their house to go on. So you're just kind of predicting a date that they're like, okay, we're not going to buy for six months. So you're like, okay, end of July, last weekend of July, that's when we're going to hit the market. Like that's what you're that's what you're saying. Like that's the time you're blocking for. Yeah. Right. Okay. They're like, oh, we're thinking we're, we're going to be ready like end of July because here's our goal, right? Or our goal is to move. So we're going to backtrack it up. So yeah, so I would put on my listing agreement today's date and then it expiring probably at that like December date. And then on my Selm, I would put our on market date of what we talked about, kind of our target on market date is on that um, seller exclusion from the multiple listing service. Um, put the date on there for the enter into the MLS um, and let them know that we can always change it. We can move it up, we can move it back, but this reserves kind of what we're talking about is, you know, you wanted to, to hit that last weekend of July for on market before we hit the, the August slump. Um, and this, I, this is going to lock you in to you are going to be my listing that week. And if we need to move it around, we can do that. Just know that I'm going to, I'm going to save this weekend for you. There is something in the MLS when you input it you have to be careful right on what day you got the listing and the day that you yes. listed yeah so is that? so yeah so once you have that listing agreement signed the date that you put on that listing agreement um is the listing there's a listing period date that is the listing period um and it's going to be that date or the date that you the last person signed it. So if I prepared the listing agreement today and it had today's date on it, mm -hmm. but nobody, we didn't have it actually signed by all the parties until the 28th of January, then the 28th of January becomes my listing period activation date. And the expiration period would be, you know, December 30th or whatever I put on there. The on market date would be whatever date was on that sell. The whatever. seller exclusion um, from the multiple listing service okay, or okay. on a modification of terms saying we're going to start okay. marketing the, the property on the MLS starting on this day. That's going to be your on market date for the MLS. Okay. So there's three dates that you enter. You enter the so listing period. The on market. Market. Yeah. 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 Well, if you have like a listing, um, like a listing agreement and then they want to buy also so you would get two different ones signed the, the listing agreement and the buyer's agreement and you would do those typically like a year out also yeah you could absolutely Just to so save if they yourself, were going to or... sell their home and buy another one you could have them sign that listing agreement and the buyer broker agreement or a buyer loyalty agreement um and as far in advance as you can make it happen isn't that a dual agency if you're having them if you no. it's not no nope. oh never it's mind just, i was i'm thinking of something else 
Yeah, no problem. The whole agency yeah. would be like if I was listing their house and um, Sam sold it, it would technically be dual agency because we're both under KW Vaca Valley. So anytime you're doing business with another agent from the same brokerage, it's dual agency. Um, oh. I don't have any issues with that at all. The one that I don't recommend is where you're representing the seller and the buyer in the transaction. Oh, I see. Yes. But you can um, represent the, the seller in both their sale and in their purchase. Yeah. And it's not, you can represent both parties. So don't hear me wrong. I just don't recommend it. It's, there's so it's much, frowned upon, right? it's so much gray area there. It's hard to represent the best interests of the seller and the best interests of the buyer who have completely separate goals in the transaction. Yeah. Okay. Nancy was saying there's a lot of issues that she's, she's heard um, come from dual agencies. Yeah. So, yeah. I didn't realize that both scenarios would do. I thought dual agency was when the agent represents the buyer and seller, not when we're both from the same brokerage yeah. and she's selling an offer. That's still do you consider yeah, due because agency? technically the listing agreement and the buyer broker agreement is with the, the broker. Gotcha. Technically, they're all mine. No, I'm joking. I'm totally joking. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so technically they're with the brokerage, and so. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hey Amy. Yep. So I have a question about that. So you have somebody who, because um, I was trying to kind of go at this, but I don't know how to actually. Um, so I know the people who own the home, and their daughter. I'm I'm good friends with as well. So I'm good friends with both of them. Um, so. In that scenario, would you, like, I, I know that the more money for me would be to represent them, but she's my closer friend. So I would rather is she looking um, to represent buy her, her? House? huh? Is she looking to buy the parent's house? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. You left that part out. In sorry. that scenario, I would have no problem with you representing both parties. Oh, Okay. Cause I was going to, I was going to ask, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not a traditional sale. You've got parents selling to a child and I, their goals, ultimately the parents goal is to have the child own it. Mm -hmm. And she already knows what's going on with the property. It's that she, mm -hmm. she knows the issues. And so it's, there's a lot less gray area in that transaction. Just like if you have tenants buying from a landlord, like the tenants know what's going on with that property. That yeah. Uh -huh. It's a whole different scenario. I, I have no problem with dual agency on a situation like that. Oh, okay. Because I was going to yeah. ask, would you would you then like, I mean, would it be appropriate or not appropriate? Or would then you just say, like I said, hey, Amy, would you take the, you know, the buyer or whatever, the listing or whatever, and to ask for the referral fee is what I was thinking. Too. Yeah, you could. And I would not recommend um, referring somebody to your mentors. Oh, no, but I was just using you instead yeah. of grabbing somebody. Yeah, you I was just person, so. <laughs> that scenario happened where I was like, I wouldn't recommend it. And then they referred it to their mentor. And then it's really the same thing because right. your mentor yeah. knows everything about the transaction. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you, there. so if you had a house, Amy, like, like your house that was for sale and there was somebody who wanted to purchase it and, you know, they're like, well, I might just go to Amy and see, like, maybe she could represent me too, like, because I want to do whatever I can to get this house. Like, like that so would be, I, had it, I mean, that so, would be good for you because then, like, you'd be, like, the buyer and the seller, you know, like, you'd have, like, both, you'd be representing both. So, like, I mean, what would you do? I guess so every situation is quite would different, right? The buyer to Shannon. Okay. Even I was when gonna, people I was call gonna me ask, I'm like, would you have Shannon do it? But then yeah. it's like, yeah, because we just have that degree of separation. And even when people like call me off sign calls to go see my listings and stuff, I might go show them the property, but I always let them know that, hey, if you decide you want to write an offer on this property, I have a business partner. Her name is Shannon. And if you decide you want to write an offer, I'm going to put you in contact with her to write that offer so that there's that degree of separation that somebody's looking out for your best interests mm -hmm. and they're like oh okay thanks we really appreciate that or if i didn't have somebody what was that like let's say i didn't have somebody to like like a business partner to refer to like shannon then would you just refer it to somebody else and then yeah, Melissa's way of give you a commission fee 
<laughs> yep, I would do a you know? I would do, and it's not gonna be so if I've got a buyer, if I've got a listing and I've got a buyer that's ready to write an offer on that listing, I'm not gonna refer it to Sam for 25%. I'm probably gonna refer it to Sam for like a 40% referral fee. I've done all the work, I've secured the buyer, I've showed them the property. You're just writing the offer and doing the rest of it. It's not gonna be like a 20 or 25%. It's gonna be closer to like a 40, 60 type split. That's fair. Yeah. Any other questions regarding our seller appointments? Um, Amy, have we, I know we have, so I guess I'm looking for more of like, what would that fall under? Um, the, the thing, how you're saying on the app, how we can change that. I was just kind of playing around and I wasn't seeing, you said designs, I thought. So do we have to create our own, like, how do we get to that screen? Because I'm like, I see it says email, it says social media, it says those things. Like I want, if I wanted to change up the buyer and the listing that's showing under guide um, on the app. How about we cover that this evening on our check-in? I like it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Buyer and seller guides. Yeah. In that case, I'm yeah. RSU King. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'll okay. see you later. Mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> and we'll record that portion of the check-in this evening. So if you're not able to get on, you'll be able to get the recording. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, absolutely.